Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast, where the Commander Clash crew discusses commander-related topics. And today, we're going to be talking about our favorite planeswalkers in Commander. So, uh, join me as always is site owner and person who doesn't really like planeswalkers that much, uh, Richard. Welcome, Richard. How's it going? Hi, Tomer. I see you vetoed my <laughs> idea for slightly plausibly playable cards in Commander <laughs> as the title, but okay, yeah, we'll go with favorite planeswalkers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you gotta you gotta dig deep. I even you were you were so uh, before we were we were recording this. Uh, Richard was so uninterested in planeswalkers in general that he we, we all picked like we're all going to talk about three different ones. And Richard came up with two, and he had a third slot. And he's like, does anybody want this slot? I can't come up with it. So I stole it, because I like my Planeswalkers. <laughs> and uh, another Planeswalker fan uh, in the group is uh, the Asian Avenger, also known as Krim. How's it going, Krim? Okay, so, like, I actually love Planeswalkers, though. <laughs> like, like I love Planeswalkers. I mean, I, I, have a super, I have two Super Friends decks in paper. Uh, so, like, yeah. Planeswalkers, Planeswalkers, Planeswalkers. I've loved them ever since their inception. Wait, what are your two commanders? I know only one. Um, so I have Aminatu, and then I also have uh, Nico Bolas the Ravager. Ah. Oh, I, I technically have two Nico Bolas the Ravager decks. So <laughs> I have a Dragon's one and a Planeswalker one. Oh, fantastic. Staying on brand. Esper and Grix is super friends. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And we also have Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive. How's it going, Seth? I'm doing well, Tomer. How are you today? I'm doing well, doing well. I'm I'm super pumped about this topic because I I like Planeswalkers a lot. Uh, And and I want want to hear people's uh, thoughts on some of the ones, especially some of the ones that I think maybe do we play too little. Uh, Those are going to be some interesting ones. Um, but before we jump into the actual cards, uh, a couple of things you can do to help this channel grow. And if you want to hear more of these podcasts in the future, you can uh, like and subscribe or whatever the equivalent is on wherever you're listening to this podcast. And also, if you want to su- uh, support us financially, you can also purchase all the beautiful stuff like the playmats stapled on Richard's wall, uh, deck boxes, deck sleeves, uh, tokens, and even uh, clothing like t-shirts and whatnot over at mtggoldfishmerch.com. All right. So before we jump into the actual cards, I, I want to just like hear everybody's thoughts on uh, Planeswalkers in general in Commander. Uh, do you like them overall? Do you not like them? Uh, how, how do you evaluate them differently in Commander as opposed to other formats? I think Planeswalkers are pretty mediocre in general in Commander. I think the biggest... I think obviously the biggest difference between commander and 60 card formats is you got three opponents. That's three people that could have an answer or have creatures to attack down your planeswalkers. So I think in general, planeswalkers are less powerful in commander than in 60 card formats. And I think the way you got to evaluate them changes a little bit in 60 card formats. You often want planeswalkers that are going to grind out incremental value, jace the mind sculptors into fairies, drawing you an extra card each turn, and eventually you kind of like snowball that into a win. In Commander, when I look at planeswalkers, I pretty much expect they're going to die before it gets back around the table to me. So I want the first activation I get out of them to be really impactful, good enough that it's worth playing the planeswalker just for that. And then if it happens to survive, then that's all just upside. That's all just a bonus. If I do get two activations or three activations, that's amazing. But it's got to stand alone on that first activation for me to really like it in Commander. Yeah, I, I think it's act like what it does has to definitely be like worthwhile because I'm assuming that it's probably not making it back to me. Either that or it's going to be like something that is just it's got a very good passive, right? Like, it, it, there are just some that I will play. Like, now with passives on Planeswalkers, I look at them as kind of like temporary enchantments. So I love the new passives. I, I'm, I don't know. I'm not as strict on my Planeswalkers, though. I'll, I'll jam as many as, like, like I, I usually have, like, five or something in almost every deck for fun. So the problem with Planeswalkers is they give the table something to do for free, which is attack it and kill it. Right. So if you play like any creature or something, right, like if someone wants to remove it, there's an opportunity cost. They have to spend their mana and their card to remove your thing, whatever it is. 
With a planeswalker, all they need to do is, uh, you know, if they have a clear line of attack, just attack with their creatures. And they probably weren't, you know, choosing over anything important, right? Like, should I take Tomer from 39 to 38, or should I take a loyalty off his planeswalker? They will take the planeswalker. Hence, it is impossible to keep your planeswalker alive, and you're just giving people stuff. They were looking like, you know, they're, they're looking for a reason to do something, and you just gave them one, right? So I agree with what you guys said. You There's one activation, and because planeswalkers are typically balanced for 1v1, they're balanced for multiple activations. So that one activation is probably going to be pretty mediocre. So when I look at Planeswalkers, I look for unique effects, right? They probably have some of the most unique effects in all of Magic. So I'm looking for those cards because uh, typically sorceries or something will be more efficient than whatever they're trying to do. But sometimes they may be color break. Sometimes they, they might just do something that no one can do because it's a Planeswalker. So that's what I'm looking for when I evaluate Planeswalkers. Yeah, and I pretty much agree with all of you, so we're pretty unan unanimous on this. Like, I think Super Friends is, like, one interesting archetype where, uh, you know, if you build around Planeswalkers and protecting them, that's super good. But, like, if you're not, um, and most decks don't, uh, the difference between protecting your Planeswalkers from one person as opposed to three people at, at a given time is so much harder. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely agree on like having some immediate value is super important with these planeswalkers if they're if they're to be good, or the thematic because like like it's not often that you would get like example if you want redundancy you want like Vidalcan Orrery you want ley lines then the Vivian uh, the three mana Vivian with the passive is good enough. God. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention before we talk about the cards is when I'm evaluating these planeswalkers on the list I'm evaluating them from non-Super Friends context. Like, I think if you're playing a dedicated Super Friends deck, pretty much all the Planeswalkers are going to be pretty good because, like you said, Tomer, you're built around protecting them and uh, synergizing with them. So I think uh, your ratings are going to vary a lot uh, depending on whether you're just, like, playing these in a random deck as a standalone card or in a Super Friends deck. So I know my list is based on um, playing this in a non-Super Friends deck rather than in Super Friends in specific. Yeah, and that's important. Important to, to uh, an important point to mention here is that we're we're looking at them primarily from a non Super Friends context. Like, there's going to be some Planeswalkers that are really good specifically in Super Friends, like the ones that like add loyalty counters to other other Planeswalkers. We we're not going to be talking about those. Um, we also aren't going to be talking about the ones that are like instantly insane with doubling season. But like, that's mostly because a lot of us don't know which ones are like immediately win the game with doubling season. So if you are a, a Super Friends aficionado, or maybe Krim knows, I don't know, uh, and you love, well, you, you don't play green with it, so doubling <laughs> I, season I don't, is I not I don't a... weigh my deck down with that nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For Super Friends decks that do play with green and, and run doubling season, I would <clears> love to know uh, what are the strongest ultimates uh, that you can use with doubling season. That would be really cool to, to know in the comment section. Maybe we'll pin one of those comments as well. All right, uh, but now we're going to be talking about the uh, Planeswalkers that we do uh, play with outside of Super Friends. Uh, Seth, kick it off with the first card that you think is pretty darn good in, in, in random decks. Oh, all right. So I have uh, everyone's favorite Planeswalker, uh, a beloved Magic the Gathering card based on its time in Standard, where people just absolutely enjoyed playing against it. Ugin. Both times. Ugin, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, eight mana, seven loyalty. You can plus two to lightning bolt something. You can negative X to exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less that's one or more colors. And then the ultimate draws you a ton of cards and gains you a bunch of life and you get to put a bunch of permanents into play. Uh, I like Ugin a lot for its sweeper mode. The lightning bolt mode, meh. Ultimate's obviously great if you actually get to it and it does only take two upticks to get there, but again, yeah, uh, even uh, even two turns is a lot for a Planeswalker and Commander. So I think of this card as a big colorless wrath that kind of misses out on artifacts in specific because it doesn't hit colorless stuff. But it comes down and mostly just sweeps away the board with seven loyalty. That's enough that you're usually exiling all the creatures, usually exiling all the enchantments and exiling has some upside getting around indestructible stuff. So specifically for colors that are weak on removing certain permanent types, uh, blue isn't great 
great at hitting enchantments, let's say, or red isn't great at hitting enchantments. Uh, I like Ugin as a way that can deal with permanents that otherwise are really tough for a uh, for a color to deal with. Plus, some of those colors have trouble with wrath. Like blue isn't a great wrath color. You can bounce, but this permanently comes down and exiles everything. So I play Ugin in those style of decks in specific. I shake my fist for all the sea monster players out there. <laughs> sea monsters though have like a billion CMC. They usually survive anyways, right? They like have the good CMC. four vibes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and I, I full agree with Seth, right? Like this card is just the planeswalker, right? One, one, of, one of the best ones you could probably play just because it goes in almost any deck, helps deals like with a lot of problematic permits that you wouldn't be able to normally. Uh, and it's like... Once again, a little more redundancy, right? You, you have all his dust, right? And then what after, right? So in a mono blue deck, like, it, it, I don't want to bounce everything. Like, some, there's just things I just don't want you to get back. So it's nice to just have a clean exile. Yeah, so this is a card for all non-white decks to consider. So Krem mentioned all his dust, that's seven mana. Uh, sacrifice, all colored permanents. So again, does it hit artifacts? Oblivion Stone, uh, five mana plus three mana activate, so eight. Kills everything. Uh, boom pile. If you're willing to uh, risk the 50-50 or Navinral's <laughs> disc, if you think you can untap with the disc, right? Other than that, you cannot get rid um, of enchantments or artifacts, depending on the color you're in. Most most colors can deal with creatures in some way, but it's these other permanents that have a problem. I think Ugin will become more important. I think uh, we're getting more and more powerful enchantments and artifacts every day. Uh, so this is something to consider, but, you know, eight mana is a lot to Wrath, and then you miss artifacts, which is a big deal, right? Like, if someone has an artifact that's killing you, this is going to be very sad. Uh, so Desperation Sweeper, but still consider, I, I mean, I play this from time to time, uh, but my answer is just play white and then don't have to deal with this. <laughs> I'm not too happy with Ugin, but, you know, it's a necessary evil. <laughs> but it removes Spirit of Companion, you can't blink it for value, Richard. You have to plus two at first. <laughs> also, uh, also worth mentioning is it's specifically uh, colorless permanent that it misses. So we've been getting more and more powerful colored artifacts. That's one of the things Wizards have been doing to try to uh, keep artifacts from being too broken is putting actual colored mana on them. So you are going to get rid of. Uh, the Bolus's Citadels or whatever. You can get rid of all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So I think like set by set, Ugin is getting even more better than it sounded like with Richard talking about it just because we're getting so many more colored artifacts these days than we used to when they were exclusively colorless. And then everything in there like pet snail is getting indestructible right so like yeah. it is it is now at good. a point where exiling is better than it's ever been. Yeah. I, I agree with you guys. I so I, a, a younger naive me would have said oh but Oblivion Stone Perilous Vault is, is cheaper than this you see. But it's actually not like Oblivion Stone. You're not going to just play it and then pass. You're going to play it and then activate it. Uh, so you need eight mana up, and that's the same amount as as Ugin. Um, yeah, not hitting not hitting artifacts is kind of kind of uh, awkward if you're if you're in a, a color that was looking for answers to artifacts that doesn't naturally have it. Like uh, black, for example, just doesn't really have any ways of dealing with artifacts. Really, um, so. It's not going to be the end-all, be-all answer to wiping everything. Maybe you do need to run Oblivion Stone over over that if you do want to get rid of, of artifacts. But being able to exile everything is really good. And also, I like that it has that added flexibility. Like, if you are let, late game and you don't need a board wipe, or the board has been freshly wiped by somebody else, for example, and you drop an Ugin and you start ticking it up, uh, you're going to start picking off any, any would-be attacker against it. And then mm -hmm. that ultimate is really sweet. So the fact that it is it is a it is a, a a board wipe. It is very expensive, but like there can be a late game scenario where you're going to be using it as a threat as opposed to an answer uh, is pretty pretty notable. So it's a card that I haven't played that much, and I probably should be playing more often now. <laughs> All right. Uh, next on our list, uh, this is this is a card that I associate with Krim a lot, um, and yet I don't see it that often. What, what's next, Planeswalker? Um, okay, so the next Planeswalker is in blue, of course, and it's Teferi, Master of Time. Now we had just mentioned, right? Like the problem with Planeswalkers is that oftentimes it's a one-time use per turn cycle. Uh, but you know, the good news here is that Teferi, Master of Time. Uh, well, first off. 
He re he's a four mana, and he's got a passive. You may activate loyalty abilities of Teferi, Master of Time, uh, on any player's uh, turn. And, and any time you could activate an instant. So essentially all his abilities have flash, and you can activate them on everybody's turn, on each person's turn. And then so it's plus one is draw a card, discard a card, minus three phase a creature out, minus ten take two extra turns. So this kind of like does exactly what I want a Planeswalker to do. Uh, I, I'm hoping more Planes, I guess... It, it would be kind of flavor fail if more Planeswalkers acted like this because, you know, it is a Teferi thing. But being able to activate on each player's turn is huge. And I've, or, like, I've already gotten a loot, right? And then, like, I essentially get to loot once or blank a creature from hitting Teferi and then loot again if it survives another cycle, loot again, and then just keep that going. And then in a four-player game, this actually is more beneficial that there's more. Like, it's even better that there's more players because you're closer to ulting. So this is exactly what I want. I'm surprised this card isn't played more. Like, I remember when this got uh, revealed, we were going like, oh my goodness, this is like a Planeswalker made for Commander. Like, you get to, it scales up with the number of players there are. You can loot up to four times and gain four loyalty per turn cycle in a four-player game. And it can kind of protect itself or, like, deal with a, a threat at instant speed. Its ultimate mm -hmm. is really good. Like, but then nobody plays it. I myself included. I don't really play this often. I played it in like my Niambi deck, and that's it. Uh, do you think we, we're sleeping on this card, or is there something we're missing here, or I'm missing it, here rather? It's so good that it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like half. It's a half a combo piece, right? You you put it on the battlefield in one point five turn cycles. You ultimate, right? So everyone guns for it immediately, but it doesn't actually do anything. It loots. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't do anything until it ultimates, right? So what you've essentially done is put a out. scary piece on the field that doesn't do much for you and makes everyone kill you. So, like, if you're playing a really aggressive deck, right? Like, if you're playing a deck that's going to two-card combo people, right? And you know your arch enemy, right? Then this is great, right? You come down, you know, everyone's arch enemy. Or, like, maybe you're playing with a very powerful pod. People can't deal with the fairy because this other guy's about to storm off, Right? So, but if you're playing it like a casual deck, this is just like, kill me now, paint it all over your head with no defense, right? <laughs> like if you're sitting there Phase. phasing things out with the fairy, come on, then you're not accomplishing much, right? Like you, you loot one, you phase out, like everyone's gunning for him. So I think it's like playing half a combo piece on the battlefield. That's like that's you got to only... finish the job if you do it, right? You got to play oh, yeah. the rest of the good cards and end the game. When you do this, then he's good. But if you're just trying to dirtle around, then this is like horrendous for you. I mean, if you're dirtling around, though, you have tons of sweepers, right? So, <laughs> but like in an aggro deck, also like this, this is like fun in like kind of a tempo deck or a, any blue X like deck that I, I've just genuinely enjoyed it in almost any deck that has blue. Because looting, found, why not? I found this card that I was hyped for it during spoiler season, and then I actually played with it a few times, and it's a card that I felt like played worse than I expected it to be in part of because of what Richard said uh, after Nexus of Fate and all these extra turn shenanigans people are really scared about a time stretch happening two extra turns is a lot so people are legitimately afraid of this and it kind of doesn't do a whole lot yes phasing is protection but you got to remove three loyalty if you're doing that it's going to be really tough to ever get to the ultimate so i found it draws a lot of hate and unless i can actively take advantage of getting cards in my graveyard like reanimator madness uh then the looting doesn't do as much as i'd like if i am reanimating or have other shenanigans to take advantage of the looting then it goes up in value quite a bit but i found just like the fear of jamming it in any blue deck because it's a planeswalker built for commander i normally end up kind of disappointed and i like loot a couple times phase it out someone kills it and i'm like i should have done something else with my four mana i don't know i mean that feels like first off you could just end it right there after you said it kind of draws a lot that's it right like that, <laughs> that you didn't need it like, you don't I, draw I, you're just looting so you're not ending up with more cards in your hand you're just filtering away lands or whatever to try to find better cards and that's amazing, right? Because you're what if you just a, harmonize. A, like, what, what, what's the blue? Like the four mana draw three, and just call it a day. You don't have to worry about <laughs> phasing and activating. And like, <laughs> what? What about reanimator decks? So, like, I I personally enjoyed it a lot in Niambi because it's a legendary permanent, so you can discard it. And my deck was all about reanimating big spells. So having a looter that 
activates for time i thought was was pretty good i never really got much play testing with it though so like i don't really know how it played in in general but would you would you uh consider putting this in like a, a blue reanimator deck like a roomy or maybe moldrotha Oh, 100. Yeah. Oh, you react, you know, if you're reanimating Jinga Taxi, just go for it, right? Like, yes, yeah. right? You can actually end the game and the hate coming at you is warranted, right? And you have the guns to back it up, kind of, right? So, yeah, right? But if you're going to reanimate value E one ones, then like, no, no. <laughs> like, just, just pay four mana, draw three cards, and call it a day, right? <laughs> do, you, do you run it in your Esper slash Grixis, uh, Krim? Oh, yeah, both of them. Um, well, that's because the, the only time we've seen this is when Krim plays it, right? Yeah, <laughs> it usually doesn't do much. <laughs> what do you mean it doesn't do much? It gets all the it gets all the hate, it right? All and it's the good. Hate. That's good, especially <laughs> when so like friend. it's it's perfect. It draws all the hate against everybody. Like upset because like oh god, he's gonna draw every turn. It's like yeah, I am. I'm gonna find that land. <laughs> Kill me, <It's>, please. <laughs> yeah, have, it, have you it, ever? I, I love this. Have you ever altered Grim? Like, have you oh, ever well, actually made it all the way to the alt? Well, technically, yes, but that's because I'd already alted, like, five other Planeswalkers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <All right. Okay. laughs> the win more strategy, classic. Hey, hey, yeah, win more is a good thing, okay? <laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we have another Planeswalker uh, that loots quite a bit, and, and it took a lot of formats by storm back in the day. Richard, what we got next? All right. We have the greatest thief in the multiverse, Dak Faden. One blue, red. So Grixis, three mana value, three loyalty, plus one. Target player draws two cards, then discards two cards. Minus two, gain control of target artifact. Minus six, you gain an emblem with whenever you cast a spell uh, that targets one or more permanents. Gain control of those permanents. I have never once ever altered this card. I've had the opportunity to. I have never done it. This, that, that ultimate is useless. <laughs> but... This card is so good. It steals soul rings. <laughs> it does steal soul ring. Yeah, that is the classic. You play three mana, you steal an opponent's soul ring. That already paid for itself. It can die now. Yeah, like I've done it. I've done it. And then if this lives, oh, it's even better. Or my personal favorite, uh, if I had, well, back, you know, the boy, when Hall Breacher was around, <laughs> you can target your opponent with it. Because <laughs> that and that felt so good. Or, or Notion That's Thief. That's nasty. They discard two, you draw two. Why not? That's a great time and a half for you. <laughs> I mean, this card is being our enemy. <laughs> Uh, th Fair. This card is great. I, this is a card that I feel like I should definitely play more, and I just forget about it. But if you think about the criteria for making a Planeswalker good in Commander, doing something right away, three mana, gain control of an artifact, I think that's just like the most efficient way to do that in Magic. And it comes attached to a Planeswalker with this extra upside that you could do some looting if it sticks around. And if you play this and tick it down, and it has one loyalty, it doesn't look that scary for the next turn or two. Like, what are you gonna do, faithless looting? Like, uh, okay, it's not like a high priority, like get the Teferi off the battlefield, or that Ugin's gonna ultimate. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, sure, faithless looting, like whatever. So there's some chance that it actually sticks around for a turn and you get to loot out of it too, but. I'm still killing it. <laughs> it's on one way. Especially if you're running the so MTG Golf has showed me the the secret lair version of it, which is old border. It actually hurts my eyes to look I at love it. It's like that there's version. something so wrong about it. I'm just like, oh. he, lo he looks like he's from Shrek. I think it's I have right. to attack it at that point. He does <laughs> Is he like what are the, the not the prince charming? What was the Lord Lord Farquaad? Yeah, yeah. That's the vibes yeah. I'm getting from him. Yeah. I'd have to kill it out of principle. It's, it's abomination. So, so Tomer said I had two cards I wanted to talk about. It's a lie. I had one. Uh, <laughs> it was this card, right? The the other two are pretty medium. Like I think this is actually my only like actual like S tier if I had to put something in here. Because like Seth said, it's three mana taken artifact, essentially. Right? And that is the most efficient. There is no sorcery uh or instant or anything in magic that does it at a more efficient rate. And the fact that it you know, one in four times you get to untap and plus one it, great, right? But three mana soul ring, uh, easy, right? That That's a worn power stone. Uh, but you can take a lot more, right? You can take a, a Bolus's Citadel. You can take anything, right? And even if they kill Dak, you keep the artifact. It's yours, right? Yep. So it's actually really, really strong. And whenever I play Is it, I put in Dak Faden because there's always a soul ring to take. 
right? But like, even if you take an arcade signet, it's not the end of the world. Like, it's like still three mana ramp, right? It's it's great. So yeah, Dak Fade and Greatest Thief in the Multiverse. You could see his grimy red glove on the normal art, just like going for your soul ring. It's great. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I guess we can all agree that this this one's pretty guys. I guess yeah. I never play, I didn't play it that much because of its price. Like, I mean, all planeswalkers are kind of expensive, so. Uh, but like, the the, it's, the secret layer version is only fourteen dollars. That's what I was gonna say. It's got and seeing, I love it. It's gotten not understandable. Better. <laughs> I know. Like, like there was there was a time when this was like fifty dollars, thirty dollars, and it's down to fourteen, so it's actually getting accessible now. At least uh, closer, closer to accessible. I'll pay extra not to play the secret lair. That's like the only time. <laughs> That's the best <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Come it's, on. Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 can't. Wa- I want Tomer to do infinite mech titan core, and then I I, I want to do Crim's infinite like Jace copying Dak Fade and deck, and then take all the mech titan cores <laughs> uh, as a counter. <laughs> That oh, would be that would be that so would be good. Match. <laughs> Another reason never to play Mick Titan again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on. We have one of my favorite planeswalkers of all time. Uh, this is Ashiok Dream Render. Uh, this is the Mirror Planeswalker. So it's one and blue black slash uh, blue black blue black. I, you, you know what it means. It's two hybrid mana. This blue black uh, starting loyalty five. So it's chonky. Um, and it has a passive ability that says spells and abilities your opponents control can cause their controller to search their library. So it shuts off sh- uh, your opponents searching their own libraries. And uh, it has a negative one ability that says target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, then exile each opponent's graveyards. Um, I love this card because for three mana, you basically have a asymmetrical graveyard wipe effect. You know, you can mill your opponents and then make them all lose their graveyard, or you can mill yourself and then just uh, hit wipe everybody's graveyards. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like a, a Soul Guy Lantern in that in that regard, which I play a whole bunch. And then um, its passive ability is just a nightmare for your opponents, which is very fitting because you know it turns off fetch lands, it turns off all green ramp, it turns off demonic tutor, it turns off uh, everything. And yeah, your opponents will have to get rid of it, but like it enters a battlefield and you've already gotten the value out of it. You've wiped everybody's graveyard. That's like priority number one. And then your opponents have to deal with it uh, because. You know, they can't search your library until they do. So, yeah, it's, it's going to die. And, and you're going to get hey, but, like, you already got the value out of it, which I think is pretty darn awesome for four man- or three mana, sorry. Yeah, that, that, wa- that one-sided kind of, like, graveyard hate is huge, right? Because everybody plays with their graveyard. So it's nice to know that yours is still intact. And as you know, I love shutting down tutoring. So, uh, <laughs> like... Oh, yeah. Lee slapped that passive on everything. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think this card is a sweet one. I, I would play this card if it costs zero. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this card is so bad. Like, why what? are you spending mana and a card to remove graveyards? We have so many things that cycle. And, like, they remove graveyards and they give you a card back. Or they come on a land, like, Scavenger's Ground. Or they're literally, like, free Pajuka Bog, Relic of Progenitus, uh, Soul Guide Lantern. Like, why are we spending a card on this? I don't Did you not read to. the passive? <laughs> that does nothing. You need to get them with the instant speed, right? If it's on the battlefield, <laughs> yep. you're just going to get murdered. Like, no one's going to play into it. Like, How they, are the you going to get murdered if they can't go look for the murdering tool? <laughs> You see? This, this is, okay, is not, this is the this 5D is not worth chess. a card to mildly annoy everyone. Like, Here's at the least 5D opposition chess agent play. gets you a card back, right? <laughs> like you get this, something and you can get people. This is how you get them, all right? So you show them the Ashiok, right? And they're sitting on these uh, search uh, spells in their hand. Then they get rid of Ashiok and they're like, all right, now <laughs> I can finally search my library, cast my rampant growth or whatever. Then you hit them with the opposition agent because they'll never expect it. They'll be lulled into a full sense of security. You can do the one-two punch on them. So, yeah. You, so, and then if you, if, why not also just play <laughs> Stranglehold? So that actually acts like a decoy. A decoy throwaway so, card that makes your actual good card slightly better. 
but I also don't I don't think like, I, you, I, I, I lean did, I lean with Richard I lean with Richard on this one uh, it has good effects like I like the effects but I feel like there's just better ways to get those effects although I do tend to crack my fetch lands into this card so you will get some like <laughs> free accidental value of people just forgetting that it exists on the battlefield because I've done that many 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 times since I printed this card but uh, opposition agent, Bajuka Bog, Relic of Progenitus. This doesn't cycle. If this, if this somehow drew a card, I would be totally on board. But you still end up down a card when you play this, and I'm not sure it gives you enough value. Am I down a card? I mean, yes, technically, but also I am displaying. You don't get an opposition agent and graveyard hate stapled into one, right? And but as I mentioned, uh, opposition agent, you get someone, so you get a card. Oh, well, like, well opposition you flash agent it is in, in response. The, but that that's this, the top. That's the cream yeah. of the crop, right? So like falling under an opposition agent isn't bad. Right? You, right? you want redundancy. That's the main thing. You want redundancy. You want to shut things down because uh, tutoring is just too much. There's too much of it. I agree with Krim. I think the most, the best part of this is the passive because there's only a handful of those effects in all of magic. So if you, for some reason, need to shut down searching, I don't know why. Like you're playing <laughs> like scheming symmetry or something. Like you hate I, green. I, I, I don't know, right? But like if you actually need that, this gives you that ability whereas the graveyard hate aspect like there's so many cards that do it better no that you should just play those are there so many that do asymmetrical there's like soul guy lantern and there's bajuka bog but it only hits one well the 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 spell bomb is one person right yeah one yeah, person yeah he'll spell bomb so yeah like it is and then the one once again the one sided is big like oftentimes I mean, you're in the colors to also reanimate, maybe cast additional spells. So it's nice, right? Like, and it's a clean exile. I think it's, it got a little bit worse with opposition agent, but I still, I still would jam both. Honestly, jam both. I really got him. That's it I, right there. <laughs> See, that's the mentality. I like that. I do like that it's a really cheap card that punishes people for playing expensive cards like fetch ends. So it's a, it is a little bit of like a equalizer for a budget deck. Mm-hmm. Just for not being They're on gonna a budget. take their other expensive cards and smash them into the ground. <laughs> because you play this. What if they don't have the mana to cast because they need to crack their fetches, though? Yeah, what oh, are they going to do? They're like, okay, uh, Gaia's Cradle, Crater Hoof you. Okay, now you're dead. I'll fetch my, I'll crack my fetch land. Well, also, think, think about They've got to look for those cards, factor. Richard. They've got to look for those cards, which they can because Ashok does the SWAT and then does the LeBron <laughs> afterwards. The sh- Shut down, dude. Think, think about the soul factor of you mill your opponent blindly four cards. They mill their grave, their combo piece or something, and it gets immediately exiled. And they're like, "What are you gonna yep. do about it?" Yeah, what are you gonna do Ashiok about Ashiok it? Sword of you uh, body and mind deck. We got Yo. it. Right? You mill. <laughs> they mill ten. Okay, <laughs> and then you mill an additional four. You exile the whole thing. We got him. Got him. Dude, you laugh. <laughs> you laugh, but <laughs> you're going to feel real bad when your combo pieces go flying out of your deck. All right. We'll, we'll move on uh, to, to the other one. Uh, Seth, what do you got for us? <clears throat> All right. We got my maybe most played Planeswalker, obviously, Garrick Primal Hunter. Uh, this Garrick is five mana, including three green. You get three loyalty. You can plus one to make a three, three beast. Uh, typical Garrick stuff. Negative three, draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. And then negative six, you make a six, six worm for each land you control. I play this like a sorcery and it has three loyalty. The negative three uh, just happens to line up with its starting loyalty. So you can play this and immediately tick down to draw a bunch of cards equal to the greatest power of creatures you control. This card has gotten slightly worse recently because they printed Return of the Wild Speaker, which is also five mana and also has that same text, but it has some extra upsides and it's an instant. instant. But before that, you had like Soul's Majesty, five mana sorcery, same exact text as a negative three. Why wouldn't you just play a Planeswalker? Because there's some chance that you make a beast with it to chump block and stay alive or other things can happen. That's that's why you play Planeswalkers is you're buying this upside. So I think that the, the negative three on Garrick is enough that in decks with a bunch of big green creatures and a bunch of ramp, 
I still play this as like backup card draw. Uh, yeah, I play Return of the Wild Speaker, but I add this also into the deck because I want to draw as many cards as possible. Seth, Garrick partners up with you, and all he is to you is a blood bag, <laughs> and he just he the, just sacks himself for immediately. You guys. Sacked. It's wow. actually the it's the best planeswalker in commander i think because you don't even have to worry about your opponents attacking it you have no fear like you just immediately play it and get all the value out of it so what do you care <laughs> wow wow garrick just homies seth and seth's like all right later dude get, get out of here get out of my <laughs> i will enjoy the cards see you garrick <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think you guys still this still this card's still good like yeah it got a little bit worse like in garrick's wake is better and in Garrick's, I no, think no, no. Rishkar's expertise is better. In Garrick's it, wake, it the board wipe? Wait, no. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Return of the Speaker. Whatever. Return, Return of the Wild Speaker is. Rishkar's like Garrick's expertise, cards, six mana. You do get to play a spell for free, though, which is a nice bonus. Yeah, I guess it's equivalent. I it's guess. close. Like, you need to yeah. have a card. But you're going to draw, like, seven, so you're probably going to cast a spell for free. So I think I would I would do, like, uh, Return of the Wild Speaker, Rishkar's expertise, probably this and then like also like hunter's insight and hunter's power so are good too for like go tall go big or whatever go big um uh creature decks the only yeah, thing i dis the, the only thing i dislike about those is you actually got to deal combat damage so i feel like there's a little bit of an extra hoop you got to jump through like this you don't actually have to hit someone with to draw the cards <laughs> Seth. So like those we can be fizzled creatures. by blockers. They can be fizzled by blockers. This one isn't. Like not that they're bad, but mm. I prefer the the ones that don't require you to Seth. get into combat. I have a question for you. Have you ever plus yes. one? Uh, <laughs> I, think so. I don't think so. I know I, it has happened. Uh, there, I think there was a time when I had an empty board when I played my Garrick and I didn't have a choice. But if I even if I have like a two two on the battlefield, I'm just I'm cycling that bad boy. <laughs> and the first play is good. Like there's gonna be a situation where somebody board wipes the turn before you, and then you're just like, all right, I'll play Garrick and I'll make a three three, and then next turn I could draw three if I really want to. Yeah, and you can uptick once to make it 3-3, three, three, and then you can draw three and kind of harmonize off. The only thing is, the ultimate is a lot of upticks. You only start at three, and you got to get to six. So unless you're doing doubling season shenanigans, which it isn't the right colors for, not very likely that you're going to ever ultimate a Garrick, this Garrick. Hmm. I feel we've ultimated Garrick on Commander Clash before. I don't recall that. I, I remember making like a bunch of worms. Um, but like Tomer listed all the green card draw and the answer is you play all of them <laughs> right like i i play garrick still like to this day and i play all the other cards you listed right and it's essentially five mana draw eight or something right when you're in green like you know if you're really desperate five mana draw three is not the end of the world um so yeah i think one of the reasons why people think green has good card draw all the way back right all the way before toski before great henge is garrick right because you pop them down you draw five off them, and it's, like, super efficient. Uh, the one reason you wouldn't play Garrick, though, is triple green, right? So all, some of the other options we've listed, like, if you're playing more than one color, then the triple green uh, is looking kind of gross. Uh, but other than that, like, five mana draw equal to power. Really strong, I think. So Garrick, old, oldie but a goodie still. That's what we, we determined. All right, moving on. Oh, Krim. This is I, I, this is definitely a, a Crim Plains Walker if I've ever seen anything. What do we got next? <laughs> this one can go in any deck, just like Ugin. <laughs> Why? Because it's colorless, <laughs> and it's Karn the Great Creator, four mana. Uh, I don't even care about the activated abilities. Let's talk about the <laughs> passive. Activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. That's right. Even the land can't be activated. So you hit him with the SWAT, right? And on top of that. Let's just in the uh, in a weird world where the, you ever use any of the other abilities. Let's go over those. Plus one until end of turn, uh, you get to uh, turn a non-creature artifact into a creature, and it's equal to its CMC or its power and toughness is equal to its CMC or mana value. Uh, and then minus two, you may uh, you may uh, choose an artifact card you own from outside the game uh, or in exile. Uh, and then reveal that card and put it into your hand. So obviously we don't have sideboards, but the minus two is huge, and people often forget that it can pull from exile. Let people like let's just say Tomer, who constantly have Cauldre exiled, uh, then Tomer's able to pull a, a, a Cauldre piece back 
from Exile. And Karn the ultimate is, tech. <laughs> the ultimate tech. As long, and then on top of the plus one is actually getting better every single set because everything is making a treasure. So you can animate to like pop a treasure, pop a clue, uh, do whatever you need to. Uh, and, and in case your Karn does die. On top of that, its loyalty starting count, uh, count is at five. So if you plus it goes up to six, which is actually kind of beefy for a planeswalker. So I love this because I, you know, in Commander everybody has artifacts. What and then that means Karn's passive is exactly going to shut down all of those artifacts. So great, <laughs> this is great. This is exactly what, and it's four mana. Such a small investment to completely. So many people spend the first three to four turns setting up through artifacts. Soul Ring this, Signet that. No, 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 no. You know, no, no, no. <laughs> That's it. No. <laughs> I feel like planeswalkers with these static abilities are like the exact opposite of what I'm looking for in planeswalkers and commander. Because my whole theory is I want them to do something immediately so if they die, I get my value out of them. The static ability planeswalkers really want to sit on the battlefield for several turns to annoy people. So for me, I don't think Karn is a card that I would just throw in any deck to annoy people's mana rocks. Although I do really like it as a pull from eternity if you have like specific artifacts that you really build around. Like when you play that Mech Titan core, Karn would be great in that deck because all you're trying to do is get Mech Titan core to go off. And this is a way you can get it back from exile, which is something that's gonna happen to your card. So I see Did this you know... as like a archetype staple for like specific artifact style decks or combo decks rather than than a hate card because I feel like it's just gonna die, right? Does it actually stick out for you, uh, Grim? Like, oh, yeah. for more than a turn or two? Oh yeah, it does because again, you set again. People spend a lot of the early turns setting up with artifacts, and if you're like example, if I'm able to like get a soul ring and this on two, like it's it's almost like a lock. Like you're you're, you're nobody's doing anything unless it, you know. Right, so unless there's like a like a super low to the ground aggro go wide deck, your planeswalkers will be fine, right? It, people can't cr like make a mech titan core because they can't activate it. They can't crew. They can't do any of that. It's just like no, 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 no. We we wait. We wait. <laughs> eh, this is four mana <laughs> from eternity. I like. It's like, would you randomly throw a winter orb into your deck? Like, you know, like if you are playing like a, a you know, a, a taxing deck or like a lockout deck, it's great, right? Like, yeah, right. You shut down artifacts, but you can't just throw this down and then expect something good to happen. Like if you don't build around it, right? So if you're going to play stasis or winter orb, you know, you need to finish the job. You need to tax the rest of their mana. You need to tax their creatures. If you just randomly tax a few artifacts, they'll just all come kill you. And Karn it's doesn't not, actually have good defense, right? Karn doesn't actually make a blocker unless you actually have an artifact that you want to expose to removal to try to block with. But I play this card a lot. Like, I play it when I try to, you know, animate Black Lotus into an attacker, right? Uh, I don't even know You've lattice locked us with this, You're, Richard. <laughs> Richard You've lattice locked us with this. I, I use this to get back my Dark Steel Axe and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 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 lattice lock. Right? Yeah. And then once it's in your deck already. You put the lattice in, right? Because you're like, everyone's going to come for you. You got to finish the job, right? And then My you put in the lattice. Got exiled. I got to have is, this back. <laughs> is, 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 is the lattice combo worth it? Like, how do you feel about that combo in Commander in specific? Because that's like, that is the most powerful thing you can do. It essentially wins the game if the board is relatively at parity. Is that too dirty and MLDE for players to for you to feel comfortable playing in many of your decks? Because it, I could see an argument, game, though, right? They, they literally know, can't play yeah. anything. Your anymore. lands they can't, were like, blown top up. Deck more stuff, <laughs> yeah. unless you know, there's a free no, nothing spell. Nothing was harmed. <laughs> yeah, I don't <laughs> see what what happened. Nothing. There is no MLD. There's no LD. I, the I lands are still I alive. The, I guess. That's yeah, they're true. right yeah. there. They're right. Just use them. <laughs> I think the question is. Are, is your playgroup okay with two-card combos? And if so, then I think this is a fine two-card combo because all you need is Karn is in Lattice. And I don't know also how much Lattice is. 11 mana or something, right? Yeah, like it's, it's not, a lot of mana. <laughs> it's not something that comes out of left field, right? Yeah. So, so I would just but. treat it as any two-card combo. It wins the game. Like, your opponents really can't cast any more spells. They're effectively locked out of the game. 
Um, they can still attack with their creatures, I guess. So they have a they have a shot at, at killing you. But like, if you set it up properly, um, then then it's over. And if you didn't set it up properly, then they can just break out of the lock. But they're not reset or anything like an Armageddon, right? Like they still have all their their stuff. As soon as they destroy Karn with, with combat, uh, they're out of it and they're back to where they were. So. That's this is fine. why Karn never lives, right? Because a lattice can come flying off the top at yeah. any second, and you need to get rid of this ASAP, <laughs> right? And you're like, no, but I just put it here for full for eternity. No one's going to listen yeah. to you, <laughs> right? They're well, just going like, to slap into this because they don't know if a Microsoft lattice is coming and ending the game any second, right? Well, I'm on the mind of like Seth and Richard. I'm not going to run this to just like mess up somebody's uh, mana rocks or anything. It's like, more than just I, messing up mana rocks, by the way, when you casually sure. play this. You know this is true because yeah. there's so many artifacts in command. My swords. <laughs> so I, I, I will insta put it into any Cauldre deck or Mech Titan deck because, yeah, if you, this is one of the best pull from Eternities because it's, it's colorless and it goes directly to your hand. Like, I think pull puts it into your graveyard, which yep. is not ideal because um, then you have to get it from the graveyard and somebody's going to exile from a graveyard and you're going to cry. So this is really nice. It puts it directly back to your hand. So I feel like it's an auto-include in Mech Titan decks. Um, and... I actually, I'm starting to play around with it in Mono Black, of all things, because Mono Black has, has some difficulties dealing with artifacts. Like, there's there's very few ways of dealing with artifacts. One of them is like a reserve list card where you'll have to sacrifice a creature or something like that. Um, so this I put into my Tashiro deck because if you can animate a problematic artifacts on your opponent's sides, uh, my deck has a lot of uh, creature removal, so I can deal with creatures much better than I can deal with other stuff. And the idea would be like play Karn, animate an artifact, immediately kill it. I don't know how good it, that is. Like I still think like you need to get that value immediately. Um, so maybe it's a little bit too cute. But at least for Mech Titan, like pull for if you, a four mana pull from Eternity, I'm gonna take it. It goes direct to my hand. If it's six around, then your opponents are sad. If you kill it, I don't care because I already got my value. So that's how I see it, at least. All right, moving on. We got ooh. I feel like a lot of these are just like crim cards. <laughs> what's the next? What's the next uh, big War of the Spark on our list for sure? Uh, this is actually my card. Actually, uh, uh -huh. Liliana, Dreadhorde General, four black black six mana value, six starting loyalty. The static is whenever a creature you control dies, draw a card. Plus one, create a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token. Minus four, each player sacrifices two creatures. Minus nine, each opponent chooses a permanent. They control of each permanent type and sacrifices the rest. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> so what, what do you like? <clears throat> Richard, what do you like about this? You're the planeswalker, the biggest critic. Why? Why this it's one? The greatest hater. It's a hater. six mana barter in blood that <laughs> draws hater. two cards, right? Like you, you, you slap it down. Like nor so, if you're not playing against go wide decks, this actually probably does the job of wrathing the board, right? And anything you lose, uh, you draw a card with, so it replaces itself, and then you can just like plop it out and make zombies as blockers. It has high loyalty, so I think it's it's fine as like just removal, like just generic removal slash value in black. Um, yeah, I <clears throat> I can see that. I mean, six man is kind of a lot for a barter and blood, although drawing two is nice. I kind of like it in sacrifice decks. I can I can see an argument that I can set up my blood artists and my woe striders or whatever. I play this, I immediately sack stuff to draw a few cards, and even though it's not taking advantage of one of the loyalty abilities, that's still a way I can get immediately uh, get immediate value out of it. So even if it dies, it already paid for itself. And then the sacrifice effect is fine. And if you're playing an aristocrat style deck, it can even be an upside. Like you don't mind sacrificing your own stuff a lot of the time. So I like this one too, although I think I'd want to be aristocrats to play it. I don't think I'd just jam it in like mono black or something. What? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but it's so good in mono black, Seth. Would you just play it for like a mono black control or something? Mono black decks, right? They're kind of in nature just naturally slightly aristocrats. Just normal. That's true. Right? That's true. So yeah. so it it just feels like it, why not, right? Like it's just another thing you could throw in there to have a 
like that benefits you from sacking things. You make tons of random, like, I don't know, tokens here and there. Uh, it, it's nice to have a like a, an edict effect because, you know, indestructible is a very prominent thing. And the passive, like, again, the passive is so good. Like, War of the Spark, <laughs> as as it seems, is currently where my head's at because, God, that was such a good set. I love that set, um, despite one green card, you know? Like, like I love that set. <laughs> we'll get to that green card. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, like, I, I think that just Black and, but like, normally just plays this aristocrat, uh, aristocrat style without even trying. So, why not? I think... I've avoided this card so much because I've had such a bad experience playing against it every single time in War in, in in Limited. Like all I remember from War of the Spark Limited is my opponent will always have Liliana, and then I just auto lose, and I just hate it so much. So I think I I don't think I've ever played it in Commander, honestly, because it's my <laughs> complete utter loathing. Starts at, the, at seven loyalty, and you just draw cards and just makes tokens forever, and you're just like, Ugh, please kill me. It's, it's like Garrick. In that, when you try to kill Lily, they at least have one chump blocker, and that will draw them a card, right? Yep. So, like, they they're not going down cards uh, in in normal modes. So it's like so much value. And but, starts at seven loyalty. Please, but it's, it, it's still Why? pretty. I agree with Seth though. It's still kind of eh. But this was like this is the this is like my third best planes walk. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, eh, it's all downhill eh. from here for Richard. <laughs> this is like okay. This is okay. <laughs> this is okay. Oh man! Meanwhile, I, was, I was like, I, I can't. I need more slots, Richard. Please, uh, <laughs> uh, six mana. I could, I could like cast two secret rendezvous and draw six cards. Oh my man. god! Like, no, <laughs> there's a lot of mana for value. Okay, <laughs> like you know, it is value, but it is expensive. You are paying for it, right? Hmm. Also, also, Richard isn't what he's not going to tell you is that he secretly also loves it because the Final Fantasy art. Yeah, Final Fantasy art. Oh, like, yeah, I've been yeah, sour yeah. since that one t- the time. Like Seth killed us with this, oh. <laughs> right? He he like, altered it. We're like, oh, alts don't count. He altered Lily, and we're like, oh my goodness. That all would have never happened <laughs> a, had I known was... that you didn't have anything. Okay, I, I just I was tired of always answering things. I wanted Richard to use his. Fair. Well, lesson learned. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so next up we have a commander that I swear people are underplaying in commander. I will go to the grave on this one, uh, probably because <laughs> of its price. Uh, this is uh, everyone's favorite planeswalker, Oko Thief of Crowns. Um, I hear Oko was pretty good in other formats, but I think it's it, he's really good in Commander. This is a Simic Planeswalker. One, a green and a blue, starting loyalty four. Has a plus two ability to make a food token. So it can immediately go up to six. Or you can plus one it to give target artifact or creature loses all abilities and becomes a green elk creature with base power and toughness three, three. So loses everything just as a three, three elk. And then negative five, exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target a creature an opponent controls with power three or less. The ultimate is irrelevant to me. I think that plus one ability uh, turning things into elks is like really good in commander because like imagine you you have a commander that you built your deck around that is like integral to your deck functioning. And then Oko just comes down on three and you tick it up one time and it's a three the elk. It, it's not. It doesn't even go back to the. It doesn't even give you the decency of going back to the command zone so you can recast it. No, you have to find a way to kill your elk Please commander. Please let me so die. You can recast it. <laughs> and that's three minutes. And it goes up. Why does it go up? It goes to five loyalty for doing this. It's so funny. I love this card. Oh, and this is like so good in commander, right? Like if you do this to commanders, this is like the biggest BM, but it's like so effective, right? Oh yeah. No, I mean like I I I. There's a bar you have to hit, right, as a green card, but, like, look, and clearly Oko hits that bar, and I'm like, okay, that card is sick. <laughs> that card is so Can just sick. just say Oko is sick? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're recording this. Ah. <laughs> I never played this card, but I should. I feel like this is Simic, uh, Simic, uh, Rowl, right? Or, uh, Dak Faden, rather. It's like Simic Dak. Yeah. Like, well, it does what it does so efficiently. <laughs> it comes down. It's a Simic Dak. It comes down, immediately answers a threat for three mana. It doesn't think of um, uh, Oblivion Ring or something like that. Like, 
that's fine, right? In the Simic colors, you don't have a lot of options to permanently answer something. You get the upside of maybe getting rid of the commander permanently. I think that's enough. I think that's enough that I should play it in like every deck. It has five loyalty when it does it too, right? Like, no, that's, that's, that's not, the insane. removal like, mode's not enough. Like three mana. Guys, I've been up drinking the Simic Kool Aid. It's, it's sorcery what? speed. It's what? Sor <laughs> this is the problem. What? It's sorcery speed. <laughs> So, like, are you guys jamming Song of the Dryad and Darksteel Mutation in every deck because you can hose a commander randomly? Like, okay, Song of the Dryad you know, is If you don't have food okay. synergies, like, <laughs> you just make an elk. Song of the Dryad like, is elk. respectable. What are, you, what are you talking about? I that's just played really, Song of the really Dryad last week. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's a really good card. Then, then okay. Then, then you guys like Oko then, right? It's another Song of the oh, Dryad. It's, it's, it's so much more. It's it does so it every single more. turn, though, yeah. unless you can remove it. Yeah, it's, it's an I mean, like, if you put it on an empty board, you can make some 3-3s three out of it, right? And you can annoy people. But is it getting you anywhere and doing anything? Like, I don't... And I don't know. Why are you randomly snapping off removal on random creatures, but not removal? What? Like, if you, could, if you could beast within for free every turn, would you? Because yes. those 3-3 three, three beasts are coming your way because their owners are upset, right? Like... <laughs> Okay, but they answer. don't have their commander. What are they going to do about it? They're going to hit me with hit a 3-3? You three three? Three? And you're like, I'm getting pelted by 3-3s. That's three fine. <laughs> I'd rather that than you, like, you corvold me or something and you're beating right. me down with a corvold. I mean, I, I, I can see a late game, but, like, it's sorcery speed removal. Like, are you really playing sorcery speed removal? Like, are you it's really playing Oblivion it up. Ring and uh, calling it a good card in your deck, right? Like, yeah. I think there's, <laughs> enough, there's enough upside. It's only three mana, so it comes down turn two off of a mana dork. Like what, that's, that's the upside. Making food? You make a food, <laughs> and then you can steal your you can trade the food for your a creature your opponents plays. If they play an Esper Sentinel, if they play a mana dork, or you can just start elking stuff when you need to and get a ton of loyalty and then start exchanging stuff later. I think the ultimate actually does have value. I mean, maybe more than we were giving it that's credit true. for. Yeah, that, I mean, well, that's not ultimate, right? Yeah. You just plus yeah, once and then you can minus immediately, right? Yeah, you so, plus yeah. once really and then minus so crazy and he something. lives. Why does he live through his ultimate? Oh my god. <laughs> I get so... Ah, I don't know. I think I should play it more. I just looked at my deck list. I played it in one themed week where it was like a character in Dante's Inferno, but I think I should play this more. You convinced me, Tomer, that this card's good. I played Oko in a food tribal deck and well, I splashed blue for it. And I had like an entire, <laughs> I had an entire pun list, an entire pun list ready for that episode. And I never drew Oko that game. I was so disappointed. I had an entire thing. I was so ready. <laughs> you got, you got tricked by the trickster yeah. himself. Yeah. All right. So, so Richard, you don't think it's good. No. <laughs> okay, okay, wait, wait. wait. So I asked you, is it good because you can turn eight it or because you can play it on turn three? Like, would you jam it out there on turn three on empty board or do 100. you save it for someone's commander to elk? You want to play it out there on, on turn, turn three. three. Or or jam it, yeah. 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 But also, it, it's, it goes to six loyalty. It's not like, the, even in commander, it's not the easiest to take it down. Like, <laughs> But it has the upside of still being fine off the top in the late game because you can just immediately snipe a commander or an Eldrazi or some like big scary thing that is hard to deal with. And it's Simic. Those are tough colors for, for answering things like that permanently. Yeah. I remember Phil played this and we had a really, was it Phil? It was, I think it was Phil. And we had a really hard time killing it because he played it so early. <laughs> and then we all had three threes, but he had three threes and we couldn't kill it. But I don't know that it did anything. It annoyed everyone. <laughs> and then we eventually dealt with it. But <laughs> it was yeah. actually... Early enough, it's pretty hard to deal with these three threes, right? Because everyone's creatures are pretty small, and then you can't get through. Even if you get through, you know, Oko's at like eight loyalty for some reason, so he goes to five, and he's still cool. So he is tough to remove. The, the game where where Tomer played oh, willingly played into my opposition agent. I think that's the game where <laughs> okay, you, but that's the game you had Oko. We Oko the opposition that's the game agent. you had Oko, ah, and and Elk and Oko took over. Oko took over the early game for like hours. Yeah, I think that's, I think this card's like grossly under underplayed. It was super expensive before, but now it's like thirteen dollars, which is expensive, but like not insane for twenty twenty two standards. Also, the jokes, Richard. Imagine all the jokes you can make when... Okay, okay. here's one. Uh, what is Oko's favorite perfume, Richard? Oh, I know this. Oko Chanel. Yes! Oh, <laughs> you used awesome. this before. You used these jokes <laughs> before. I, I didn't get to them before. I would know that unless you gave me that I, joke. 
How did I? I when did I, I think use we, it? I think we just made you tell him anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah. just told us the jokes. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. See, it's amazing. What other planeswalker can you do this with? Nobody. Uh, Nobody. All right. <laughs> we'll move on. Oh, Richard, this is, or sorry, Seth, this is, I think, Krim's favorite planeswalker, uh, but you have the honor this, of introducing it. This, this was tough. So my top two planeswalkers, I knew I wanted on the list. The third planeswalker is where it got a little bit hard to find one to add to the list. I thought about going with Karn Liberated. I think there was an argument for Karn Liberated as removal, but what did make my list, uh, in part for Krim, is Nissa who shakes the world. Uh, Nissa who shakes the world. Krim, you love War of the Spark cards. You were just talking about how amazing that set is and how you're in a War of the Spark mood. So <laughs> Nissa who love shakes it. the world, five mana, five loyalty, uh, plus one, puts three plus one, plus one counters on a land you can Control, untaps it, uh, and then negative eight, you get to uh, make your lands indestructible in search for any number of forests, put them on the battlefield tap. The big deal is static ability. When you tap a forest for mana, it adds double mana, adds an extra green mana. And this might seem counterintuitive because if you read this, there's no ability that reads like it's going to be immediately impactful, which is my whole theory for evaluating planeswalkers. But where I like Nissa is essentially as a mana doubler in a mono green deck. Because green is so good at ramping, you can often get to the point where Nissa kind of works like a ritual where you play it. And especially since you get to immediately untap a land that's gonna tap for double mana, it often generates mana the turn it comes into play. So you can use this like a crazy ramp spell, even if it dies, sure, whatever. You got this big turn out of it by doubling your mana for a turn. So uh, in mono green decks, especially very forest heavy mono green decks, I like Nissa as a, as a weird mana doubling type effect. I hate this card. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. It's, it's so, so good. I like it. Plus, I, I never... want to make sure we talked about it to hear what Krim would say. Uh, okay. So <laughs> what do you hate about it? Everything that it does is, is a problem, right? Like, the fact here is that it comes down, right? And then it... it it makes a 3-3. Vigilant, by the way, haste land. And then on top of that, you usually untap a forest, right? So that's two mana again. So you can smack me, and then you also get to play something with that mana, usually Veil of Summer. And then, uh, so, like, it... D I don't think I've ever seen, like, somebody untap with this and not, like, pretty much capitalize and win. Or put them so far ahead. Because, exactly like Seth had mentioned, that passive is absurd, the passive is absurd. It doubles all your mana. I I have won numerous games where I let people untap with Oko. I have lost every game where they, like this the person untaps with Anissa. So like oh, and you could also play them together, and then all of a sudden you get clocked by a bunch of six sixes. But okay, you, you whatever. guys are too traumatized by standard, dude. But <laughs> this card is still good in Commander. This card is still absurd. Think about it. Think about it, how it's much a Zendikar you resurgent that can be removed. And we have a bunch of those effects, removed right? How? So if you're playing the Seth, you know, the deck that Seth is stating where you have mana doublers, you can untap lands and have a big turn. Obviously, this is nuts, right? You put all the mana doublers in. But as a fair card, like it's it's an easier to remove uh like gauntlet of might, gauntlet of power, which the one where you choose a color and you can double your mana. It's an extra planar lens. It's a Zendikar resurgent. And you don't want, even want to animate your lands because then all your lands get wrathed away, right? Uh, so it's it's okay. Like if you untap with it, obviously great things are going to happen, but it's so much easier to remove than all those other mana doublers that, you know, it's just like an okay card, right? Unless you have like an actual combo where you can untap all your lands and, you, you know, you have Yavimaya, the Yavimaya that turns everything into forest to actually enable this, right? And you keep going, then yeah, sure. Uh, but I think you guys are being traumatized by like standard and you know, you're like, oh, but what if they disdainful stroke and then untap and hydroid crisis? It's over. <laughs> they they like, do yes, hydroid crisis though. <laughs> right? It was over standard. But in commander, the three players will take turn murdering Nissa and then you will untap with nothing and then that'll be that. <laughs> Oh, I mean, like 100%. Every Commander game I see a Nissa, I kill it instantly. I don't care which one it is. <laughs> I, this is my card, and I agree with Richard. I, I wouldn't just run this in any deck just because you could, because I also think turning your land into a creature is often a downside, because you're making your land susceptible to everyone's sweepers. So there it definitely is downsides to playing this card fairly. Unfairly, though, 
I think it's actually like really, really strong, especially since it land you untap that makes double mana. Kind of means Nissa costs three mana, which kind of makes it the cheapest of the mana doublers out there because you're getting that two mana back right away. There is no such thing as fairly with this card. I don't understand what you mean by fairly. It's like, 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 it, when you play this card in your deck, it's implied it's going to be used unfairly, right? Because you are going to un, you are going to double your mana. Like some shenanigans are about to happen. Like and you know that. Yeah. So you wouldn't you wouldn't just auto jam this into mono green decks? I feel like yeah, you hundred percent like any mono green deck. You jam right? it in like, a two color deck like make, uh, like. Golgari, yeah. Simic, Celestia, whatever. If it has green, why not? You play forests, and it's and so what? You lose a land to a wrath. It's not like you weren't already ninety lands ahead of everybody else here in green. <laughs> I feel oh. like I just jam it, like in any. Well, maybe some two color decks I think of, think about, but Liavamaya definitely helps with that. It's the yeah. deer boar for green, so that helps a ton. But like any mono, I have it like my Carco stack is gas. Is it like good? If it dies, yeah. whatever. I mean, I guess yeah. you can wait till the till the later game to play it to make sure you can take advantage of the double mana right away, rather than running it out mm -hmm. on turn five if you're not gonna do anything with it. You need it's to do perf. something with your mana too, right? Like your deck needs to be built around you know untapping and using ten mana. Like if you cynical. actually have nothing relevant to do with that. <laughs> I mean, we just listed like a bunch of ways that green just refills their hand by casting a single spell. Yeah. Like right. So yeah. I and feel like mono green has ways of, of making sure they'll cast have things to cast on. This but, is the but perfect. Like, there's a lot of risk to, play. to playing this card, right? So if you actually get everything done and untap with this, you need to make it worth it, right? Like to actually make all of this worth it. So it's not that much. That, that, that's not even like a real hoop. That's like half a hoop. That's like a, a, a quarter of a hoop you have to jump through. I, mean, I don't think we've seen planeswalkers untap that often, like on Commander Clash, like any planeswalker, right? Well, okay. Like it's just there's just so. Let's take like. It's the opposite of Curse of Opulence or whatever, you know, like a solemn. Like, you just put, like, the slightest, you know, like, incentive there and people will do it, right? Like, so, if like, oh, you get value? I don't know what that value is, but I'm going to remove it from you because it cost me nothing. So, here, birds at Nyssa, right? Like, How? so, it's a lot How? to untap Nyssa has things. bodies. Nyssa puts bodies just all birds over the... Birds fly. Birds, okay. <laughs> oh, no. You need to make a lot of Natural birds, predator. right? Like, to, to do this. On top of that, we're, we're, we're going to assume that, yeah, okay, almost every planeswalker will just die, though, right? It, like, they're, if we're, we're just going bare naked, just... Here's a plane. If we use on that criteria, Krim, all you got out of this was a 3 3 land creature, right? If you just play it, use its ability, and it dies, that's all it gets, right? Yeah. Got but it, I don't know. I don't think that's it. That's enough, dude, because it's still. So, just because of the untapped potential is just too good. It's too good. I guess you get two good. mana out of this, too, right? Yeah. You get two mana. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It does require more time i think to get value than immediately usually unless as, as seth said you play a little bit later and then you can immediately use it as a ritual effect but okay i i, I like that it traumatizes crim a lot i'll keep that in mind do you this games. makes crim spend every card he owns and every yeah, true, single mana yeah. he has yeah. to kill you I I actually, like, you're like played. i just wanted to untap and draw four <laughs> cards with gear you will never <laughs> untap if i if i have the mana <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's the better lesson. Never play green when Grim is on the table. <laughs> I, 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 I will, oh, like, right here, right now, like, you know, like, uh, in all honesty, it's not an act. I will kill you if you, if I see this, uh, like, and I will spend the rest of the game to kill you. I don't care if you're just like, oh, I brought, I bought this pre-con and then I added Nissa. Sorry, bud. <laughs> like, what, what, what if it's what if anime Nissa? Nissa? In the pre -con? Oh, the blue-green one. Yeah, I kill, no, I kill that immediately. Like, like it's, it's, sorry. I swat Nissa down on site. <laughs> on site <laughs> alright well we were discussing a lot of uh, War of the Spark Commanders I think like your entire list is just War of the Spark Commanders actually uh, but there's one card uh, that is old school uh, The crim it's not green uh, and it's your pick so so what do you got for us <laughs> it's Nico Bolas Planeswalker everybody come on don't 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 let, let's not lie here okay the every, every like Nico Bolas Planeswalker if you're in Grixis come on why are you not playing unless you're playing CDH okay I understand maybe an eight mana Planeswalker is not what I want to play in a cast deck but Outside of like a Spellslinger cast deck, Grixis has a huge problem dealing with enchantments. 
What is well, the what first... does the card do for? Them? What does the card do for? Like, well, for exactly. For so here? so it huh. is a four huh. mana and then and then blue black black red right. So it has a plus three. It comes down with five loyalty plus three destroy target non creature permanent right. So Grixis has all the problems in the world dealing with enchantments. Why not just blow it up? Why not just pop an opposing Ugin? Why not pop whatever Nissa's on board? Because that's what I will target. And then minus uh, minus two, you can steal a creature. Just steal it. Just give me that. Just give me that. I like. And <laughs> wow. I don't. I don't ever alt because the alt doesn't matter. Usually the first two are good enough till I get there. But if I were in the world of alting, it deals seven damage to target player. That player discards seven cards, then sacrifices seven permanents. <laughs> wow. Oh, this is everything that's great about Magic the Gathering. Are you kidding me? This is such a cool card. <laughs> and it's like, it's just, it's good enough to be Timmy. Uh, and and it, it's such a Timmy Planeswalker, right? Like, come on. Like, I'm just out here blowing up all the, the, the non-creature permanents. This is a real thing that you have a problem with in Grixis decks. And if you're playing five colors, yeah, this is sweet. This is still sweet, no matter which version. If you can cast it, why not? It's a little bit outdated. I don't know. It's like eight mana. It's eight mana. I like You're it. Right. I do like it. I don't play Grixis nearly as much as Krim, so I don't think I play it very often. If I was playing a Krim deck, I would probably play it. I, I'm pretty sure I would. But eight mana is a lot. Like that's the that's the downside. Unlike Ugin, it only gets a thing each turn rather than a whole bunch Fair. of things. But, I mean, eight mana, you can steal a creature or blow something up. I think it's fine in, like, a, a slower, more controlling Grixis deck. It only takes two activations to ult. The problem is it doesn't untap the creature. So if there's, like, you know, the scariest creature on board and it attacks on the last turn, you steal it, and it's not your blocker for Nicol Bolas. So if you could somehow block with the scariest creature, then maybe you do something. Isn't Ugin just better? Wait, who won? Did Ugin kill Nicol Bolas? Nickel Bolas kill Ugin. What happened? They're they're in but, the prison but, realm. They're in the prison <laughs> realm. But yeah, they, 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 they're, they're in the kids everything. Right Nickel Bolas plucks one creature. You gotta take it. But uh, what about all the other creatures coming in to murder your eight mana planeswalker? Eh, well, you stole somebody's best creature. Is, is this the best Bolas planeswalker? Is this why it's oh. on the list, or is this the OG? <laughs> I think the, this the is War of the Spark one. I like the War of the Spark one a lot, but I, I like I also I also think the God Pharaoh is really good. Um, like well, actually, this is this is hard because I love all of them. I think they're Krim all just good. likes them all. I love them all. I play them all. They're in green. They're, <laughs> ah, they're so good. <laughs> I guess this is the only one that like deals with something Grixis traditionally can't deal with, which is enchantments, right? Like, right. I'm looking at the other boluses, and none of them can deal with non-creature permanence. If you had War of the Spark Bolus plus this Spark Bolus copying every other Planeswalker. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, you're blowing up a spicy. lot. You're blowing up two lands right now. Oh my god. Okay. In all seriousness, this is just a, a, a my love for Volus than anything else. Like, but in Grixis, it does struggle with dealing with a lot of things. So if I want a Planeswalker in Grixis, I want something that can actually deal with a, a, whatever I target. That's not a creature. I think you kind of you kind of won me over a little bit. I I, I need to try out Volus a little bit more in like Grixis decks. Just believe. Just believe in him. Just, <laughs> just believe in him. It is a very cool card. I'll give you that at the very <laughs> least. Like even if, if I'm not like bought in, like it'll immediately die. It's like a one of the coolest cards on on the list for sure. Okay. Like a, it's like a limited all star. Like you know, yeah. it, you can't cast it, but when you do, it will be the yeah. most powerful yeah, thing yeah. on the. It's like it's actually yeah. pretty good if you get it for free somehow. But how do you get to eight mana and be in a reasonable state to do this and protect it? Yeah, people are like, oh, you're tapping out for eight mana. Are you winning the game? I was like, no, I'm going to blow up one thing. <laughs> <laughs> or steal something. Or huh? steal one thing. Yeah, yeah. Stealing is good. I have cast this good. numerous steal. times on Clash, and I and we've all seen his power because yeah. everybody <laughs> immediately tries to kill me, and they can't <laughs> because he's so good. He has a blocker now. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move on. We got two more on our list to cover. Richard, what do you got for us? This All is right. one of the f slots I stole. <laughs> All right, uh, Ugin the Ineffable. Can't believe I get my slot for this. Uh, six <laughs> mana, <laughs> four starting like loyalty. <laughs> Colorless spells you cost cast two, uh, cost two less to cast. Plus one, exile the top card of your library. 
uh, face down and look at it. Create a 2-2 colorless spirit uh, creature token. When this card leaves the battlefield, put the exile card into your hand. Minus three, destroy target permanent. That's one or more colors. I mean, this is sweet, right? Like, I think this card's also another War of the Spark All-Star. The passive is great. Free mana rocks. Whenever I want, I can just take I can just take a dump and drop mana rocks everywhere. Or I can make <laughs> but, a bunch of tutus that come back. Or I can blow up six anything. Mana. Six mana. Come on, it's Aren't, a colorless have you already? But I mean, have you already played your mana rocks by the time you played this? Like, in what well, world are you playing your six drop and then playing your soul, soul rings? That's a little. I, a little I awkward. always draw them in the wrong order. You see, I. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you, you're, I'm speaking strictly as a person that's very rarely had a soul ring turn one. Like, I can probably <laughs> remember how many times I've had a soul ring on one. Um, that's and fair. so, like, but okay. In all seriousness, though, like in an artifact deck, like the reduction is huge. Right, like in a colorless deck, this is huge. The plus one gives a body where it doesn't even matter if, like, you know, whatever happens to the two-two token, you will get the card. And then the minus three answers any permanent that it has colors attached to it. So, t- in typical Ugin fashion, yes, just one, but you know, still pretty decent. Uh, like, so I, I, I'm a fan of this Planeswalker. I've run this card an embarrassing amount of decks because it was it it was like a budget inclusion is it's only four dollars i think it was most of the time it was like three dollars so it's pretty pretty affordable as far as plane walkers go colorless reduction like like crim said artifacts artifact reduction it's really good uh it plus ones to give card advantage you got a two two blocker you want it to die because then you get the card afterwards and then you can destroy permanent one more uh colors which is great um in let's say like a red deck that you know needs a way to deal with enchantments. So you're like, boom! I snipe, I snipe your enchantment. It can't get rid of most artifacts, but at least the colored ones it can get rid of. But the colorless ones it can't. But it could also just get rid of like most permanents, right? Like if there's a problematic creature, you can snipe that too. Um, I don't know. It's just like a good value engine. It just it just does what it does, and it's not like oppressive or anything. You're not gonna like win you the game, but like. I don't know. You just cast it. You get you get to ramp with it in colorless focus decks, and you get to plus so, one. So do you put damage. it in non colorless decks? Yeah. So so the first the static is basically useless. You're just using it as value. No, if you're an artifact removal. deck, if you're like an is it artifact or something like that, you can oh, run oh, it. That's not, sorry, man. Like a non artif where the static has no point. Like, would you play mm. it in those decks, or does the static need to? The the you way the, the nature of commander though, I just don't see a timeline where almost like every deck has some spell that can get a reduction cost off of the the static. Yeah, I mean so if okay, if you're playing Eldrazi, <laughs> right? I'm like, okay, you oh, know, the oh, ramp yeah. from eight to ten <laughs> is useful. <laughs> Right. Yeah. If I'm playing this to cast my arcane signet on turn six for zero, I'm like, that's probably <laughs> that's a, not what I'm here for. That's a double right? play. But Richard. you know, if I'm playing Karn, Microsynth, Lattice Lock or something, okay, yes, I can see how this ramp is useful, right? <laughs> Why does your but, your brain keep going to that, Richard? <laughs> I, I'm no like worries. expensive artifact. What is an expensive artifact you would play? Microsynth Lattice, right? But just for value, I don't know. I, I think in an artifact deck, it's worth it. I don't think it has to be a big artifact. You can also just play a whole bunch of medium-sized small or small artifacts. artifacts. Yeah. So I think, like, if I'm an artifact deck with a, a more than average number of, of things that the uh, static works with, then I'm interested in it. But would I just play this in a deck that only has, you know, the standard, whatever, 8, 10 mana rocks or something? Probably not, unless I was really, really desperate for, for the removal aspect of it. But... I don't know. All right. What do you Tomer, do, Tomer? You here. Why would you not just play Hedron Archive over this? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Like, it, it comes down How way do sooner. It gives you access to what? that two mana way earlier. Are you and beating? you can jump through a bunch of hoops to draw some cards. <laughs> what? Right? Like, no? No! Is it close? What? I think they're kind of How close. How is it even close? How is that even like a... That's not even a comparison. What are you talking about? Hmm. What? Now that Richard mentions it. <laughs> no, 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 no,
Very, very cool. Isn't this that one Ugin is six pay mana. Six mana, spend two no. turns to make two spirits this and is, then draw two is, cards if they die. This is six <laughs> mana have a static cost reduction of two, so you could get mul multiple mana off this. You could you have the flexibility of making card advantage or blowing up a problematic throw, and it could get most mostly everything except for colorless artifacts. Like that's the only thing it misses. It hits it hits problematic creatures. It hits enchantments. It hits colored artifacts. It hits planeswalkers. Yeah, it's good. It's that flexibility. And then if you don't need to blow something up, you make a chump locker that's card advantage. And it's like, it's very good. I like it a lot. Heatron Archive is Garbo. Oh. Absolutely Garbo. <laughs> How? How dare? Well, take dear? that back, Tomer. You How take dare? that back. <laughs> I like you again, but we can't be slandering Heatron Archive on our podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm getting North Star on this on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> if Richard would have let me have that spot, I would have put Teferi Hero of Dominaria. But for almost like just like, but, but yeah, I'm glad like, we I, did. <clears throat> glad we did not give Krim that slot. <laughs> I, sh I should have taken my slot if I do. <laughs> you did. You, you, did it, you just gave it up. All right, fine. I, I don't even. No, Heater Dark Eye just like ruined Ugin for me a little bit. I like it. I'm thinking about Black, he's better. It's better. No, no, you're just tainting a great card. All right. Let's move on to the last card. Let's wrap this stuff up. Let's wrap it up. All right. Uh, last card on the list is Vivian, Champion of the Wilds. Spoiler alert, War of the Spark. It's really good for Placewalkers. <laughs> That's what we learned. Uh, this is two and a green. Starting loyalty four has a passive ability. You may cast creature spells as though they had flash. Uh, you can plus one it to, say, until end of next turn, up to one target creature gains vigilance and reach. Or you can negative two it uh, to look at the top three cards of your library, exile one face down, and put the rest at the bottom of your library uh, in any order. Uh, for as long as it remains exiled, you can look at the top card. Uh, you can look at that card, and you may cast it as if it's a if it's a creature. So gives all your creatures flash. Just that's that's the thing. It's a Vidalcan Orrery for your creatures. Negative two card advantage. You can get a creature spell out of it, and then you can cast it with flash as well. And it kind of protects itself by uh, making a creature have vigilance and reach, so it can attack and still block, and it has reach, so it can block uh, those pesky fledgling ospreys uh, that are enchanted. Um, I think this card's like really gas, like three mana. Uh, if you're in a creature heavy deck, you have to be in a creature heavy deck, but you're in green, so obviously. Giving all yourself flash is already pretty darn good. It kind of protects itself, um, and people are gonna be scared to attack into you because you can flash in a creature blocker. Like, if you have mana up and you have Vivian on the battlefield, people are going to think twice about uh, swinging into her. She can also give them Vigilance and Reach and it's card advantage. Like, it's so much value for three mana. It's kind of kind of seen, I if, think. If she comes down early, it's it's so brutal. It's so hard. to Like, cause, you know, you haven't quite set up. You can't quite pressure her. Late game, you have all, she comes down. You have all the excess mana to flash something in. Uh, like... I, I like her at all phases of the game if you're playing some kind of green deck. Um, this Funny enough, this is actually a card that I kind of like. So there, there were two cards I speculated on, right, when that came out. I, I bought a ton of uh, Teferi uh, Time Raveler, and then I bought a ton of Vivian. And so it's funny that the those two cards actually just hard can Like, well, Teferi hard cancels Vivian. But the thing is, like, I, I think this card is such a solid three-mana Planeswalker, right? Like... People, you want, again, You people try to play multiples of the same effect, and so many people try to get the Ley Line of Anticipations and, and the Vidalcan Orrery. So this is your third copy. So I, I like it. And it doesn't get blown up by, like, artifact removal. Uh, it does get blown up by good old creatures. But the thing here is I, I love it. I think this card's sweet. I feel like I need to care about Flash more than just liking to flash in creatures if i'm playing something that like um triggers each turn varus kadena something that really incentivizes you to be able to play creatures on each of your opponent's turn then i'm interested my problem with vivian <clears throat> if you play it and take it down it goes to two loyalty two that is not a lot that means pretty much anything's gonna kill it so if you play it on turn three it's probably gonna die. If you play in the late game, it does get better, but then, I don't know. Do you really wanna be playing a three mana Planeswalker on turn seven or turn eight, or are you missing out on that static ability for too much of the game? So I don't think it's bad, but I don't know. I think I'd really have to care about flashing in creatures for me to include it. The other thing is, the negative two is whiffable. You only get to see three cards. Like sometimes you don't have a creature in those top three cards, and 
if Vivian dies, you can't cast those cards, right? So you take your best combo piece and then someone kills your Vivian and then you're without it forever until you find a pull from eternity. I, mm, I, I, think uh, it's I was going to say this card like was good flash, until Seth said that a Vivian died. You lose the card. Yeah, but just ignore the negative two and then imagine some Valken Valken Horary for three mana. I'm great. Nah, solely and you can sometimes on draw passive. cards off. But do you play like, Vidalkin Ori in any deck? I, I only play that in decks that really care about its ability. I wouldn't just play Vidalkin Ori in a generic green deck just so I could. If it, if it, if it can't trip, yeah. But this might. Well, maybe can trips. Maybe can. <laughs> I need the percentages. But if that minus two hits like a really high percentage time, I think this card is good. Um, I, I think yeah, three mana, like right? just draw a card with all this random upside is sufficient it's not like draw a card right it's like uh yeah. anticipate or something right um but i think this card is actually good i think this is like the best card we've talked about in at least an hour uh, <laughs> wow <laughs> so, <laughs> wow like with flash is really strong like told that you just sit here with flash and you're like you want to attack vivian you want to test what i have in hand and you have like sacred tribe elder right uh but they Yo, don't that's know that. a good block that's the that block to block it. What? yeah <laughs> Max like value. You can have anything, right? You can have a questing beast. You can have a love struck. You know, they don't know. And the plus one, I think, is actually really strong as well. Like giving vigilance, like is your defense, right? And reach. So reach is important hmm. because people can't just fly in and pick off that two damage. So I actually think Vivian's pretty decent and probably the most underplayed one here because I don't see the Vivian only that often. thing that Richard has said was pretty decent is the one that can block birds. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the only one that gets his grudging respect <laughs> like, oh, that blocks birds is a fledgling osprey check okay well, it, it has a bow on the art and it has reach then i, I have to upvote this <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it, it might I, be better than i gave it credit for like i think if you play in the if you do have the mana up it is very protected you're right so that i might have been underestimating like how unlikely someone is to attack you if you have flash and mana up I'm just worried that if you're running out on turn three and take it down, it's probably going to die, and then you lose that card forever, even if you do hit with it. I mean, but if okay, you like can soul ring, like you soul ring turn two Vivian, like yeah, l l your arch enemy, right? And you're, and you're actually in a position to defend yourself too, right? Like you can actually now untap, you know, cast creatures, get card advantage, keep going. So actually, and, it's and that works decent. with Llanowar Elves or any of that too. You don't even yeah. have to have soul ring, and you still get the turn two. Yeah. So. Yeah, all right. I'm I'm coming around a a little, a little. Yeah, someone play this and tell me if it works. How many creatures do you need for that minus <laughs> I mean, two to actually be like legitimate? Like it's you... one of the best. It's one of the best cards in werewolves. Like obviously, like you can flash is so good with werewolves because you can skip your turn and immediately flip them, <laughs> turn into knight or or flip them it's or like whatever. Werewolves. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Werewolves are a meme, but I I think like that's where where like it kind of showed up on my radar, and then. I've been starting to dabble with it in creature heavy decks since. I mean, I mean this card flash is... allows you not to get board wiped. Yeah. Right? Like how many times thing. have you yeah. played a creature and yeah. then someone board wipes or you're like, I expect the board wipe coming and I don't want to play a creature. So I just pass my turn and do like nothing. It so gives this you an allows extra turn you, of value. Yeah. Th this gives you the ability to evaluate and then, you know, do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. And, and like, again, like this, this is just, I don't know. I, I think it actually has a, pretty beefy loyalty counter for or counter yeah. for three mana it goes up to five it, and and almost also yeah. let's be honest here okay <laughs> no. i feel like our pod specifically isn't that a great we're, we're talking like yo we're, we're like turn one creature okay only person that does that is richard right like other than that <laughs> it's usually everybody dirls around until turn four or five <laughs> <laughs> those sacred tribe elders still get in for a damage right <laughs> like there's always these stupid dirly creatures that people will have no hesitation sending to your planeswalker <laughs> right Spirited Runner. companion, you know. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's you all these totally things, like a solemn sitting around, like, here, sure, right? Why not? Yeah. Nobody plays solemn. What are you talking about? <laughs> Apparently, it's a bad card now. Who knows? <laughs> it is. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, so we went through, like, 12 Planeswalkers, I believe. Um, three of us, three each. Uh, as to wrap this up, I want to hear everybody's top Planeswalker pick. Top one, if you can only choose one uh, that you would jam in a, a commander deck, wh what would it be? Ugin. Ugin. Mm-hmm. Dak faded. Okay, well, 
<laughs> Could not say Nicol Bolas. <laughs> you have to say Nissa. I, yeah, like, I, like, the, thing the problem is which Nicol Bolas, right? Because and also like if I I I change the planeswalkers up for this list, or else it would have just been all Nicol Bolas, right? Like <laughs> every Nicol Bolas would be on here. But I think if I had to choose one, Nissa. That's Nissa. hard. You gotta dude. be there's Nissa. So cool... No, okay. Hey, there's <laughs> so many cool Nissas. Fix this. Too. Like, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're those, are, those are all problems. They're this is all very problems. popular. I think, okay, so just to pick one, I'm gonna go actually with uh, not Nico Bowles or a Teferi. I'm gonna go with Karn. Karn. Ooh. Ooh, creator. Nice. Yeah, the creator. I like it. Dark Horse. All right, well, I'm gonna pick Oko. I'm gonna I'm gonna start jamming Oko a lot. Like I don't want to see I want to see the power of Oko at the table. I'm excited now. I'm pumped. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for our show, everybody. Uh, we covered 12 planeswalkers. Obviously, not a not a complete list of all the good ones. Um, so please let us know what your favorite, uh, planeswalker that we left out is. And also, again, I'm really interested to hear what do you think the best planeswalker is paired with doubling season? Which one has the biggest game winning ultimate or has the highest percentage of winning, uh, once you get there. So let me know in the comment section below and like, and subscribe, all that good stuff. And until next time, friends, see ya.